So um, we're going to be changing tax uh, somewhat uh, for the next uh, session, uh, talking about the challenges that uh, um, doing this in a federal context uh, represents. And uh, it's very appropriate that uh, the interim director of our partner institution in putting this conference together, the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, uh, be the person who uh, chair this panel. So Elspeth Heben, who's also a professor in the Department of History, uh, will, be, uh, will be doing the honors uh, for the next panel. Thanks very much, Andy. Okay, very pleased to introduce our two speakers. Perhaps I'll introduce you both right now and then just let you move along. Okay, we have, um, we're addressing politics and uh, public health. We have two speakers, Professor um, Malcolm Bird, who's from the University of Winnipeg and a, a associate professor of political science who's interested in state modernization and uh, is going to bring that perspective. And then we have Mike DeVillers, who is uh, associated with McMaster University with the Department of Psychi uh, Psychology and uh, also based at the uh, McMaster Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research and the Peter Boris Center for Addictions Research at McMaster University and St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. And uh, you'll be giving us public health perspective. So uh, please welcome our two speakers. Uh, hello all. Uh, uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm Malcolm Bird. I'm an associate professor of political science uh, at the University of Winnipeg. Uh, I'd just like to thank IHSP for inviting me here and for paying uh, all of my costs. It's really a delight to be here and, uh, and to speak with you all. Um, uh, when I'm not uh, talking about marijuana, uh, I'm studying the evolution of uh, state-owned enterprises or crown corporations, uh, which are really fascinating companies because they have to balance commercial and policy and political aims all in, all in one venue. Uh, and they are still responsible for 3.5% of our, of our Canadian economy. So they, they're still very important uh, institutions. Um, my uh, thesis was written, and I continue to work on uh, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, um, which I'll speak about in just a, a little bit. And how it's modernized its operations, both in an operational sense, but also in a governance sense, and how it relates to its to its political masters. Uh, I'm also very interested in the partisan slash big P political dynamics around decision making in Canadian governments. Uh, who makes the decisions? Uh, what variables shape uh, their the, those decisions? Um, and, 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 and questions like that. I'm really interested in the interaction between state bureaus and their politically, uh, their political masters, their elected political masters. Uh, so my interest in marijuana comes from, from, from these two areas. Um, as we know, uh, in, in this province, uh, in Ontario, uh, the, the, the Crown Corporations are going to play a lead role in distributing uh, this product. Uh, I, I think this is a very uh, uh, practical and pragmatic solution. Uh, if I was advising a government, I would tell them to you know, have, have, have the SAQ look after it. Uh, they have expertise in distributing products. They have a, a, a whole infrastructure in place uh, on the Political front, uh, if anything goes wrong, you can always uh, fire the president of the SAQ or the LCBO. So there's sort of some political uh, insulation uh, there. Um, um, this is an area that I really should be doing more research on. That is the relationship between these crowns and, and this new uh, marijuana regime. Uh, we run into a few empirical problems, uh, partly because I think it'll be difficult to get people to talk to me. Uh, frankly, uh, about it because they're trying to figure it out themselves. Uh, and I usually get uh, the best information from retired uh, senior civil servants, and, and this policy just hasn't been there. But this really is uh, an area uh, for, for more empirical research. Um, I have four sort of main points, I guess. Um, marijuana legalization, in my view, illustrates the vanity and the short-term thinking uh, and the complete detachment of the federal government from the policy and the political reality of implementing this policy in, in contemporary Canada. Uh, I do not see marijuana being a significant political problem, uh, and it's only be it being adopted for purely uh, politically expedient reasons by, by Justin Trudeau's uh, liberals. Uh, so that would uh, kind of put me on the negative critical uh, segment of, 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 of the speakers here, I suppose. Uh, this policy will cause uh, their provincial counterparts 
uh, to expend significant time and resources and political capital that, in my view, could be better used elsewhere. Uh, there will be real costs, uh, societal and economic costs to this, but they will accrue at the provincial, civic, and community levels uh, a, long way, a long way from Ottawa. Uh, legal marijuana will cause a host of, 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 of political and policy problems for the provincial governments, which I will outline in a, in a bit. Um, but the most crucial one of which will be that it will be provincial governments that will have to determine the optimal marijuana usage rate. Okay, they will be responsible for, for creating the, 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 the regime that will shape our behaviors around this, this substance. Um, as we know, uh, like other tobacco, alcohol, gambling, how governments structure the regime has a very strong correl correlative effect on people's attitudes towards uh, different substances. Um, It'll also, there'll be a few other uh, issues I will, I will outline. Um, and I don't think there's that much money to be made from this. Um, I think the federal government will make some money from this, but that's largely because they don't have to pay any of the costs associated with the implementation. Okay, so um, let me s tell you how I see decision making working in, in Canada uh, and, and within our provincial and our federal governments and for, to a large extent this will kind of frame, frame my discussion. Um, uh, and that this policy will take precious time and energy away from what I consider to be real problems that the provincial governments, certainly my provincial government, uh, faces. So there's an opportunity cost in a political sense. Um, political power, for those of you that uh, uh, are unaware of how Canada's system works, is, is highly centralized in the senior executive. Uh, that is the first minister's office, the, either the prime minister, and this is particularly true at the provincial, provincial level. Um, there was much talk about the centralization of power in the pre prime minister's office when Stephen Harper was in, in power. Uh, it is my understanding that this is continuing. In fact, I would argue that under Justin Trudeau's liberal power is even more concentrated in the Prime Minister's office. Um, so that's, that's uh, how I see political power uh, working, but I think there is grave misunderstandings as to the effects that this centralization of political power has on, on policy. Um, if anyone's looking for a book on this, Ian, uh, Ian Brody, uh, Stephen Harper's former chief of staff, has just written a brand new book on the pr Prime Minister's office, and it's, it's excellent, excellent reading. So the, the, the popularized image we have of the First Minister's office is one of a looming or, or omnipotent executive dominating other sectors of the state, be this the legislature, the civil service, crown corporations, et cetera, et cetera. The First Minister is sort of all-powerful. Uh, his, his, his power is derived from the fact that he or she uh, is the head of government, they're the head of cabinet, uh, they're the head of parliament, they're the head of the party, they make all the appointments. So on paper, power is, is, is very centralized. And I think average Canadians and much of the political science community, however, do not understand how this plays out in practice. Um, I don't want you to think of political power or the Prime Minister's office or governments in general as like looming, domineering over the, 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 the subservient sections of the state. I want you to think about political power uh, and the Prime Minister's office as being a besieged fort. Okay, a besieged fort that is surrounded by hostile forces that are lobbing a constant stream of very serious uh, economic and societal problems at them all the time. The source of these bombs, so to speak, uh, there's two general characteristics of them. One is an allocation of resources, okay? Everybody in society wants more stuff. They've got really good reasons why they deserve more stuff, and nobody wants to pay more tax, okay? Uh, so the, re the allocation of scarce resources to unlimited wants at its core is a political set of decisions, and those are made in the senior executive. The other source of these challenges, more acute in nature, in that there is a never-ending supply of economic and societal-based problems from strikes, scandals, plant closings, disintegrating trade agreements, natural disasters, economic turmoil, bankrupt companies, failure to build a pipeline, Donald Trump, 
okay, that all of these serious problems need to be dealt with by governments. Governments deal with all the problems that other collective organizations can't deal with. That's why they end up in the lap of the government. Okay, governments do not enter uh, they do not enter sort of a blank state. They don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, you know, what am I going to do today? There's already 10 problems that need immediate and effective political management. You need to think about the prime minister's office or the premier's office. It's, it's chaos. That's my understanding. Chaos. Flying by the seat of their pants trying to solve all of these really serious problems. So the net effect of this is that governments have one or two, maybe three things that they can actually be proactive about. Okay, everything else that they do is reactive in nature. Okay, and they're trying to solve these problems as they go along. They're doing cost-benefit analysis in sort of a political sense, um, trying to hope that they can resolve these challenges and not end up on the front page of the paper looking silly. The result is governments are deeply constrained in their behavior. Path dependencies rule their world. For the federal liberals, Legal marijuana can be viewed as one of those proactive policy areas. For their provincial counterparts, it's one of those bombs that's being thrown into their laps. So much for cooperative federalism, in my view. Is illegal pot really a political problem with a big P in raw political terms? My answer to that is no. Let sleeping dogs lie. Okay, that's, that, that would be my answer. Does your average suburban soccer mom or gray-haired old lady really care about marijuana? And the answer is no, they don't. Is locking up people for possessing marijuana a good idea? No, I don't think that, that's either, but there's other ways we can deal with it. So what we're, what we're looking at here is uh, Justin Trudeau and the liberals get all of the political credit and all of the costs and burdens are going to fall onto their provincial counterparts. Um, this bothers me because there's a limited amount of time, energy, and political capital uh, that governments have, and much of it, certainly in the province of Manitoba, is going towards this issue. Uh, my province faces some really, really serious problems. We have an $800 million annual deficit. We have 11,000 children in state care. We have a downtown that is in really poor shape. Um, these are really tangible issues. On the federal level, we have manufacturing jobs disappearing. We can't seem to build a pipeline, which is absolutely central to the success of this federation. Uh, NAFTA is being renegotiated. Uh, this is where 75% of our trade goes. So there's, there's other issues that I think this government should, this federal government should be dealing with. Okay. Um, when people asked me, I was doing a talk, somebody said, look, everyone's smoking pot anyways, why not just legalize it? And I'd say, look, because governments don't need holes in their head. They've got enough problems. That's, that's, that's my, my biggest reason. Anyways, um, but I have to admit, I was completely wrong on this. I used to talk to my first year students uh, about uh, you know, I use marijuana legalization as an example and I would get up there and I would make a chart and I would explain to my students why legal marijuana will never occur. And I, I was very, I thought of myself very crafty, very smart. And I went through with my students about all of the challenges that the government would face. How are you going to sell it? How are you going to grow it? How are you going to regulate it? You know, what's everyone going to think? What's Big Pharma going to think? What's this? What's that? What's your grandma going to think? Anyways, I, 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 like I said, I thought of myself as very crafty. Um, uh, but, but, but I was wrong. What I, what I was trying to show is that governments don't wake up in the morning and decide that they need a new political problem, a hole in their head. Um, but like I said, obviously I, I was very wrong. Um, and that is because I completely overlooked the dynamics of federalism in Canada. Um, to put it in really crude terms, uh, the federal government is useless. It doesn't really do that much significant stuff in your day-to-day -day lives. Everything that is important in your day-to-day -day life is done by their provincial counterparts health, education, uh, labor, environment, anything to do with the cities, those are all creatures of, of the provinces. So that's, my, that's sort of my first key point, I think, is that all the political credit for, for appearing hip and cool and progressive is accruing at the federal level, and all of the problems are going to accrue at the provincial level. And these are real problems, okay? So governments are going to have to 
and they're in the process of figuring this out. How are we going to sell it? Where are we going to sell it? Who gets to sell it? Et cetera, et cetera. Who grows it? Who wholesales it? All of these are really messy. They're really dangerous. Any wrong step, it'll end up on the front page of the paper, and then you've got another live political problem. Um, of course, then there's all of the policy-related questions that we've been talking about here. How are we going to establish so, sort of an effective way for determining how high someone is? What about the whole driving issue? On and on. I know within the provincial government in Manitoba, uh, in the employee standards section, my wife works for workers' compensation board. They're dealing with this. Insurance, rental housing, et cetera, et cetera. All of these bureaus are dedicating significant time and resources to this matter. Um, and so there are significant resources being expended right now uh, to this. Uh, adding further problem to this is that the federal government wants a cut of the money, and yet they're not going to do anything. And they're even micromanaging how you want to distribute it. They're going to say you can't have, uh, you can't grow it yourself. You can grow it yourself. And Manitoba and Quebec are are saying no. Uh, you you you. you we're not going to permit people to do that. I wonder if there'll be a court case over this. It probably will be. Um, it's a good idea. The, the problem with the homegrown marijuana is that we're going to have to figure out a way to delineate between legally acquired marijuana and illegally acquired marijuana. And if people are growing it at home, that's going to be considerably diff more difficult uh, 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 to do. So the provincial governments are muddling their way through, through this problem. And as I mentioned, you know, many of them are going to be using their, their crown corporations, uh, their liquor boards, to, to manage this issue. Um, this will hopefully keep out some of the criminal elements. It'll also mean that there'll be a monopsony buyer, so they'll have a lot of uh, bargaining uh, power to uh, negotiate low prices uh, with the suppliers. Um, now, um, but like I said, the real issue here is if, if you accept that institutions shape individuals' behavior, um, and we look at things like gambling, tobacco, and alcohol, uh, think about how, how the popular perspectives on these three indulgences have changed over the last 40 years. 40 years ago, gambling was illegal in much of Canada. Uh, to, alcohol was... was, was similar to how it is today. But of course, tobacco use was, was everywhere. I mean, we would all be smoking here. And think about how we look at tobacco users today. I mean, they're, they're, they're um, you know, they're sort of kind of like lepers, actually. So, so, the, so the rules, the regulations, the public education campaigns uh, have a profound impact on how we view the use of these substances. And so this is now going to be uh, uh, applied to the marijuana regime, okay? Uh, so there's a, if we agree that there's a co strong correlation between how it's regulated and, and, and how the government manages it and popular perspectives on it, um, then we, like I said, that, that, that sort of decision is gonna land in the laps of the provincial governments. Um, yeah, what, what is the optimal level of marijuana usage? Um, how is the provincial government going to trade off the, the gains and the losses to the use, through the use of this, of this substance? So um, they're going to, again, this is going to require significant resources. Um, and again, we're dealing with the fact in all of these indulgences, tobacco, gambling, alcohol, and marijuana, we know that a relatively small percent of the population uses most of the product. So that is another variable we need to think about. Um, the revenue. I don't think there's that much revenue to be made here. And the biggest reason is that I don't think the revenue is going to balance off the costs. The illusion of higher re revenue uh, principally deals with the nature. We need to kind of think about sort of how we quantify the revenues and the costs associated with indulgences. The revenues are concentrated and relatively easy to identify. It's usually a big check from the Crown Corporation or, or the revenue agency to the government. You know, the LCBO hands the government a check of about $1.5 billion a year. So it's easy to figure out what, what the revenue aspects of indulgences are. The, the costs are much more difficult to figure out, and this is because they're diffused over various sectors of the state, over various organizations, including families, companies, communities, individuals, et cetera, et cetera. We know from a uh, 
comprehensive regime, uh, a comprehensive review of the cost of alcohol, uh, that's about 10 years old now, 12, 14 now, uh, that the, the, the overall cost of alcohol uh, are twice what the revenue are. When, once you add in all of the emergency room visits and the addictions and all these other issues, Twice, twice as much as the revenue. One reason why gambling has been so popular with provincial governments is that they get the revenue in one big check and all of the costs associated with gambling, which often accrue to a small minority of problem, problem gamblers, um, are borne by the gamblers themselves or their families, not the state. One of the things that's done in tobacco is the strong correlation that they've made between tobacco usage and healthcare costs. Okay, and so that's been able to rationalize, governments have used that to rationalize, to crack down on, mayor, uh, on tobacco usage. Um, I just don't think there's that much money there because pot is quite cheap these days. When I was 25 years ago in Vancouver, you know, grandma marijuana cost uh, $15. And today it's $10 and I've even been reading that it's, for many people, it's, it's in the sort of six, seven, eight dollars. Uh, range. So we have an illegal system in place uh, that is able to provide this product to people for a relatively low cost. The only way you're going to be able to push up the price is to eliminate that illegal market. That's going to cost you more time and resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are we going to do about youth using uh, marijuana like alcohol and tobacco? Uh, these companies have recognized early on that you need to get people interested in uh, consuming your products before they're of legal age. Uh, you know, these companies can be very crafty when it comes to marketing to young people. We're going to have to set up a, a system or a group that's going to actively regulate uh, this aspect of uh, marijuana usage. Um, how are we going to rationalize legal marijuana with our current tobacco regime where we have an ardent mechanism and a whole bunch of systems in place, including about 110 people that work at Health Canada whose sole goal is to reduce tobacco usage. Are we going to say smoke pot but don't smoke tobacco? Are we going to legalize marijuana and then set up a whole bureau at Health Canada to convince people that it's a bad idea? I'm, I'm not quite sure sort of how, how this is uh, uh, going to work. Um, Mr. Blair here said, you know, we're not going to encourage people to use it. Okay, are we going to come out and say using it is bad? Don't be a pot smoker, like what we say to people with tobacco. So that the, sort of the normative tinge to the, to the public health campaign is, is going to be really important. Uh, what about drug use overall? Now, I know uh, people don't like the, 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 the gateway drug theory. I recognize it has some problems. But what are we saying as a society to young people when we legalize marijuana? If, if you have problems, if you're stressed out, smoke pot. We could, we could also tell them, you know, uh, if you're stressed out and, and have anxiety, why don't you go to church? Why don't you exercise? Why don't you do yoga? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so so there, there is sort of a value statement uh, here. Um, from a political perspective, we're going to create a, brand, a whole new lobbying group uh, whose goals will be to make marijuana easier to uh, acquire and cheaper uh, and reduce the price, and they will be lobbying provincial governments. Uh, we've already started to see um, the corporate sector uh, pushing governments in terms of their handling of impaired driving and other uh, issues uh, with regarding this new sort of pot regime. Uh, this group is going to be interested in, in, in pushing this product, and like the alcohol and tobacco uh, lobby, I expect them to be well-funded, uh, professional, and well-organized, and able to make their, their views known uh, to the political sphere. Um, I guess depending on what this new regulatory regime looks like, um, and where and when and how you'll be able to smoke marijuana, there's a good chance that it's actually going to restrict the times and places where one gets to smoke marijuana. And I don't know if the, if the user community fully recognizes this. Um, it's not just going to be an open, you know, big 420 session. Um, and then I guess my final point here is, is just, uh, this is just another example of how the states, the state and its policies are further encroaching on every single aspect of our lives. Such encroachment illustrates the increasingly statist nature of our society, whereby all activity is falling under the control of governments rather than other collective solving institutions such as uh, you know, families and communities, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, legalized marijuana illustrates the increasingly controlling and interventionist nature of our modern state um, into every single aspect of our existence. And, and from that regard, it's, it's, it's a real loss of uh, individual freedoms, in my view. Okay, thank you very much.